to my humble abode. Come in, come in, come in. Yes, yeah, shut the door, shut the door. Come have a seat, have a seat. Well, I'll, I'll pull you up a chair. Sit down, sit down, sit down. All right, today we're going to talk about the civil rights movement and why it wasn't fair. The Civil Rights Movement was a struggle for social justice. The blacks fought for equal right under the United States law, even though slavery was abolished. Discrimination was still prevalent in these times, though. It, was on it wasn't only the blacks <laughs> that fought for these rights, though. Many whites also saw the injustice and fought for the civil rights. In this documentary that we are currently filming, Yes, look at my hand. Very good. <laughs> we will talk about some important people and what they did and why they're important. We will also describe the legacy that the civil rights has left on America because that's important. We will also review some, some, some pictures and a, uh, a, uh, a political cartoon. And we will explain some further details about the issue. Sound nice? Alright, welcome. And today, we have the Malcolm X over here, who would like to share a story. Please, explain to us your life story. I am the Malcolm X, and I believe I played a role that was very vital towards the civil rights movement, as you have discussed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. I was born on May 19th of 1925, oh, fascinating. and I was a minister, a human rights activist, and a prominent black nationalist leader. Ooh. Due largely to my efforts, the Nation of Islam grew from a mere 400 members at the time to about 40,000. Ooh, neat. In just a span of about eight years. Wow. I like to articulate passionate and naturally orated things when I speak. Interesting. Very cool. Continue. I think that we should exhort blacks to cast off shackles of racism by any means necessary. And I do mean any need. Including violence. Because violence is bad. Even though Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I was the fourth of eight children. Wow, that's a lot. To a simple man who was also a preacher. Cool. Who was also an active member of the local chapter of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Wow. And he was an avid supporter of the black nationalist leader, Marcus Garvey. Cool. True to his civil rights activism, my family was subjected to frequent harassment from white supremacist groups. Interesting. You don't like that word, do you? <laughs> Including the Ku Klux Klan. Ooh, nasty group. And one of its splinter factions, the Black Legion. Interesting. My first encounter with racism was before I was even born. Interesting. Explain. As I recall, when my mother was pregnant with me, she told me a party of hooded Ku Klux Klan riders galloped to our home. Brandishing their shotguns and rifles, they shouted for my father to come out. We are members of the Ku Klux Klan! And we're here for your father! Get out of here! Oh, 
Did he come out? No. The harassment continued when I was four years old. And local clan members smashed all of my family's windows. Sad. To protect the family, father decided we should move to Milwaukee from Omaha. Well, that's cool. And then later, to Lansing, Michigan. I like that place, it's cool. By the early 60s, I had emerged as a leading voice of a radicalized wing of the civil rights movement. I presented a philosophical alternative to that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke only about peace. Think about that guy. I just don't think that was really going anywhere. Why not? He, he was highly critical of my views. Explain, please. Please. And even once said, I feel that Malcolm has done himself and our people a great disservice. I don't think I am. I think I'm leading us down the right path. Of course you do. I encouraged violence if it was necessary, unlike King. You don't like him, dude. However, February 21st, 1965, at the Audubon Ballroom in Manhattan, Nancy. I was preparing to deliver a speech when I was assassinated. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for your time, Malcolm X. We appreciate it. I was born in 1928, and I lived through most of the African-American struggle for racial equality. I was a confidant of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. I wrote poems to show the power, courage, and tenacity of the African American experience. In the poem I, I wrote and titled, Still I Rise, I wrote, may I read the poem? I've got confirmation. All right. You may rip me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trade me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. <laughs> Does my sadness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still high rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed heads and lowered eyes. Shoulders falling down like teardrops. Weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard. Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines. Digging in my own backyard. You may shoot hatefulness. Shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? <laughs> Out of the hearts of history's shame, I'll rise up from a past that's rooted in pain. I'll rise. I'm a black <laughs> ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling. I bear in the tide, leaving behind night. Of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. 
I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Top 10 events in the civil rights movement. Number 10. May 14, 1954. Brown versus the Board of Education. The decision of the Plessy versus Ferguson made in 1896 was overturned by the Supreme Court, saying separate educational buildings were inherently unequal. Number 9. December 1, 1955. Montgomery bus boycotts. The boycotts were done in protest of segregated public transportation systems. It started with Rosa Parks in 1955, to 1956, when the Supreme Court ruled segregated buses unconstitutional. Number 8. January 31, 1957. SCLC was made. January to February of 1957 Martin Luther King Jr. and two others established the SCLC Southern Christian Leadership Conference which became a major part in organizing the civil rights movement. Number 7. February 1, 1960. Sit-ins. The sit-ins were done to protest segregated food places. Number 6. May 4, 1961. Freedom Rides. The first Freedom Ride was on May 4, 1961. The Freedom Rides took place to test the bus riding segregation laws in southern states. Number 5. October 2, 1962. James Meredith. James Meredith was the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. Number 4. August 28, 1963. March on Washington. 200,000 people joined the congregation at the Lincoln Memorial, where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. Number 3. July 2, 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. President Johnson signed in the act that prohibits discrimination of all kinds. Number 2. September 24, 1965. Affirmative Action. President Johnson enforced affirmative action towards prospective minority employees. Number 1. April 4, 1968. Assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. Martin Luther King, Jr. was assassinated on April 4, 1968. He was looking out on the balcony of his room at the Lorraine Motel, when he was shot by James Earl Ray. I am Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Although, I was not born with that name. Mm -hmm. My original name was Michael King Jr. Mm -hmm. I was a Baptist minister and a social activist who led civil rights movements in the United States mm -hmm. from the mid-1950s until... Well, we'll get to that part later. Mm -hmm. My leadership was a necessity to the movement's successfulness in ending the legal segregation of the African Americans in the South and other parts of the United States. I rose to national prominence as head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which promoted nonviolence tactics, such as the massive March on Washington in 1963 to achieve civil rights. I don't mean to brag or anything, for I consider myself a humble man. But at the age of 35, I was the youngest man to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. At the March on Washington, I gave the famous I Have a Dream speech. Uh, here's a clip. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed 
the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree is a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who have been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still badly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note Insolent, insofar as her citizens of color are concerned, instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make the real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the, unlit, to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright days of justice emerge. And that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the worn threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In this process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. 
We must forgive. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to, distract, to distrust all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must take, make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their adulthood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, For whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro is in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulation. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and st staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, though, even though, we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the states of Mississippi a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of the skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream I have a dream that one day in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls and sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. 
I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, My country, tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole top of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every city and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, gays and lesbians, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro, spiritual, free at last, free at last, great God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. It inspired many. At one point, I led a massive protest in Birmingham, Alabama, that caught the attention of the entire world <clears throat> by providing what I like to call a collision of conscience. I was arrested upwards of 20 times and was assaulted at, at least four <laughs> times. I was awarded five honorary degrees and was named Man of the Year by Time Magazine in 1963. <laughs> Not only did I become the symbolic leader of American blacks, but also a world figure. On the evening of April 4th, 1968, while I was standing on the balcony of my hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee, where I was supposed to lead a protest march in sympathy with striking garbage workers at city, I was assassinated. I uh, really enjoyed that I have a dream speech. I thought it was really great. I should What you say? Ooh, that you only meant well, well, cause you did. Ooh, what you say? Mm, that it's all for the best.
again. Get out of the dove hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's Malcolm X. It's Malcolm X. <laughs> <laughs> Breeze! Give us a spin. <laughs> You're beautiful. I was born in 1928, and I lived through most of the African American struggle for racial equality. I was a confidant of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. He was a snack. <laughs> <laughs> to show the power. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Have you seen that? No. What if the what if that the Me Channel song had lyrics? Oh. You should listen to it, it's pretty great. The same guy also makes one for the uh, the the Wii shop. <laughs> That's also pretty funny. Wait, no. Happy. I'm in the hood. What's up, my homies? Left, right, 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 left, right, left, right, left. Right. <laughs> Just actually leaves. It's a bad meme. Green tracksuit. Oh, you gonna record this? I mean, when you get it. I'm gay! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>